Hello, welcome back. Um, this is our chapter four series of mini lessons. Chapter four is kind of an interesting collection of topics. It covers, it starts with metric measurement and microscopes, and then it moves on to staining bacteria, and then it wraps up with classification mechanisms, how we classify microorganisms. So those are the three topics I'm gonna to put in this uh, lecture section. So we're gonna do measurement microscopes, and then um, staining, and then classification. So that's my goal. So the, the first part of the chapter talks about metric measurement. I, I'm, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on that. Um, you did some labs in by 211 or some, hopefully some other science courses. We use metric measurement um, when we're taking a look at microorganisms and we primarily use the micro scale, not the micro scale, the micrometer. So the micrometer, which is a millionth of a meter. So that's the unit that most um, bacteria are measured in. We also might see nanometer when we're taking a look at molecular size or viruses, because viruses are really, 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 really small. So when we see the units used that we're gonna be using meters for length primarily, um, we're gonna focus mainly on the micrometers and the nanometers. For the introduction to the microscope topic, all right, so where we're first going to be seeing these um, measurements is in the discussion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So this is a diagram showing the wide range from really large uh, waves within the spectrum to really, really small ones. For what we can see in our rods and cones in our eyes, we can see a narrow little strip of this inspect the spectrum called visible light. It goes from about 400 nanometers to 750 nanometers. Remember, nanometers is a billionth of a meter. And so this is our rainbow color, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. So this is what we can see with our eyes. But there's a lot of other wavelengths out there that do different things in our universe. This is not just related to humans. This is universal electromagnetic spectrum. So the really long waves, and remember a wave is measured from crest to crest from one wave. So radio and television waves are really big. So 10 to the two meters, that's 100 meters so from the peak of one the peak of another is like the size of a football field. Um, so those are radio waves and television waves, where we need those big antennas to capture the signals being sent through those. Microwaves are quite a bit smaller, less than a meter. Infrared even smaller than that, and we get our visible spectrum. UV light, x-rays, and gamma rays are the smallest. So these are 10 to the negative 12 meters. Um, so I think that's a trillionth of a meter small from one uh, crest to crest. And those carry a lot of energy with them. And that's why they're dangerous is because they can penetrate through our tissues, and through our skin and cause mutations to our DNA. So what we're going to be looking at are microscopes that utilize the visible spectrum in our light microscopes. But we also might see some um, in the UV light spectrum as well. So let's take a look. When we are taking... Um, talking about microscopes. Microscopes take a specimen and make it look bigger than it normally is. Uh, like a telescope takes a specimen and makes it larger um, and closer, right? So we can see planets and stars and stuff. With a microscope, we're taking things that are really small and making them visible to the naked eye when they wouldn't normally be. So think Leeuwenhoek, Robert Hooke, um, and all those folks that increase the ability to, for clarity to see these really small things. And most microscopes are made with curved glass lenses. So just the nature of light, our visible light that we can see, but light in general, um, is it comes through, it travels in a straight line until it hits something that might make it refract. And this is what we call light is bending. So in air, the light wave might be going in this particular direction. And then it hits glass, which has a different density. Glass is more dense than air. And so it will curve and then it will be sent in this direction. And by taking advantage of that nature of light refracting when it hits different substances, you can curve lenses, especially if you curve them on both sides, like a biconvex shape of a lens. That light coming in, it comes in, it refracts, and then it come, when it comes out, it refracts again. So we have two points of refraction. And by doing that, it's going to make the image look larger than it actually is. So this is the basis behind magnification with curved lenses. So what that allows us to see is it allows us to see things that we wouldn't normally get to see with our naked eye. So if we were to just, so pre-Leeuwenhoek time, we would be limited to things 
um, about half of a millimeter, right? So if you ever, if you have a metric ruler, I think you got one with your kit, the tiniest lines on the metric side between each one of those lines is a millimeter. So we can see a little bit less than half of a millimeter, but anything smaller than that, we cannot discern with our eyes. We just don't have that capability. So using all of these other types of microscopes allows us to see things that we wouldn't normally see. So just for some comparison, um, human red blood cells, chloroplast, mitochondrion all fall around, looks like five to 10 microns. Typical bacteria are around two to five microns. Then when we start getting into the nanometers in length, then we can talk about viruses and large molecules like ribosomes and DNA and proteins. One nanometer scale, we're getting onto individual smaller molecules like amino acids. We have yet to actually witness a structure of an atom. We can see small clusters of atoms. I'm gonna post a little video, a couple of videos on um, this concept. One's going to be the scale of the universe and one's going to be, um, I think it's, gosh, it's something about atom, like a little boy, but spelled A-T-O-M, Adam's ball or something. It's a very cool kind of a stop motion, cute little animation that they made with moving um, small atoms around on, a, on one of these kind of microscopes. It's very awesome. So. We have never visually witnessed an individual atom, so we've never seen an atomic nucleus or a proton or a neutron or an electron with our, on, with our uh, eyeballs. We know that they exist through experiments, um, but we have not reached that ability yet, yet with microscopes. Okay, so you have a compound light microscope you checked out from the RCC library. These are ones that we just had an extra supply um, at RCC, so you gotta make sure you're taking good care of them when you are using them at home. Um, so you should have some familiarity with light microscopes. Actually, you may not, because some of you, your by 211 was in an online format last term. So if you don't have experience with using a light microscope, um, come to an office hour um, uh, and we can talk about it. Um, I'm also planning on holding our weekly live kind of question answer periods with talking about the lab stuff. Um, so make sure that you are comfortable using a light microscope. And so here's just, I'm not gonna go through all the parts and pieces, um, but things that you need to keep in mind when you're using a light microscope. These are binocular, which means you have two eyepieces and you wanna get comfortable having both of your eyes open. It just gives you a better view of the specimen. Um, you only ever want to use the fine focus knob on any of the high objectives. So that's the um, 10x, the 40x, and the 100x objective, the oil immersion. You never, ever, 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 ever use the coarse focus knob on uh, anything but the low scanning power, the 4x objective. You don't want to break your slides and ruin all the hard work that you did and scratch our objectives. That would be a big no-no. Um, another thing that's a really important tool is this diaphragm right here. So it's usually under the stage. It's usually a little lever that you can move and it adjusts the light that's coming in. That's really helpful for contrast because bacteria are really, really small. And if you open up the light as much as it can be, the light's going to um, kind of hide, it's going to overpower the specimen. So make sure you're getting comfortable with that diaphragm lever to adjust the light as you are um, looking for your specimens. All right, so again, just get some help. Make sure you're using the microscope properly. You're also going to have to learn how to take the picture um, of what you see your specimen with your phone or a camera. So holding this up to the eyepiece, it's a little bit tricky, but I think most people can get the hang of it and I can help with that as well. So just some common microscope tips and tricks for you. When we actually start looking at our bacteria under the oil immersion, there's a reason why we needed you guys to have the oil immersion microscopes is because bacteria are really, really small and we wouldn't have been able to see their characteristics with just the high objective. But the nature of light we just talked about is that it refracts when it goes through different media from air to glass to the specimen to glass. And so when you have your objective opening is really, really small, right, the opening of your lens, some of that light could get lost um, as it's refracting away from your specimen. So by putting a little bead of immersion oil and putting the lens directly into the oil, 
it has the same refractive properties as the glass. So it's a special immersion oil. That's why you only use that. Um, is it won't refract. It'll go straight up into the objective instead of bending like we see over on the left. So that's why it's important to use your immersion oil on the only on the 100X objective. It does not belong on any of the other objectives. We'll talk about microscope care and use of oil immersion in those weekly lab lessons that we'll get to. All right, so now I'm just gonna run through some different examples of microscopes. You guys are gonna be using what's called a compound light microscope with a bright field setting, if you will. So what that means is your background is typically light in color and your specimen is vibrant, either stained or in the case of the plant here, the LOD of the pigments are just already illuminated there. So these two are pictures of bacteria in a bright field um, microscope. There are some light microscopes that do dark field where the background is dark and the specimen is illuminated. We do not have this. It's usually a special filter that you'd have to use, but we, we're just going to be using that light, light field or the bright field. Um, these are still kind of cool to see these pictures, even though we may not be using them. Um, phase contrast is another use for a light microscope where there's different polarized lenses that use um, that kind of change that bending of the light. Uh, phase contrast is really good for looking at living specimens and cellular structures. It kind of highlights some of those obscure structures a little bit better than just regular bright field. Um, fluorescent and confocal. So these use uh, UV light waves instead of visible light spectrum and dyes that are fluorescing in different uh, in these wavelengths. So you can hook a dye particularly to a structure that you want. So in this picture down here, the nucleus has a purple stain. All of the cytoskeleton has the green stain, and I'm guessing little protein bits or something are the little red stains. So you can be more specific as to the structures you're looking for. So those are microscopes that use mostly, you know, visible or close to visible spectrum, a little bit on the UV spectrum. These other uh, next two, we have transmission electron microscopes and a scanning electron micro microscope. They use electrons instead of light rays, and they use magnets instead of lenses. So the electrons um, are focused to give you that image. Transmission electron microscopes kind of make slices of your specimen. So here is a picture of a cell or nucleus, right? So here's the nucleus, here's the nucleolus. Um, these are mitochondria, all of these. And if you know your cell anatomy, you might see a whole bunch of endoplasmic reticulum all around in here. Kind of cool. Um, here is a phospholipid bilayer, right? You can see the two little layers. And then here is just a picture of the bacteria. So you can see things way closer in an electron microscope than you can with a light microscope. And then with a scanning electron microscope, again, it's using electrons and magnets to help focus this energy. But instead of seeing inside of cells, scanning electron microscopes look at surface structure, more like topography, um, seeing things uh, from the external surfaces. So here we have some bacteria bacteria, and some chromosomes. Well, it's probably like human chromosomes there. And then the last couple microscopes I'm going to talk about are atomic force or atomic microscopes. We have what's called scanning tunneling microscope. Um, this is what was used to make the little video of the atom, um, the atom stop motion cute little movie. And so here they, they sharpen a point uh, so small. It's the tip of this um, scanner, this little probe is uh, almost to the point of uh, as small as an atom. And then it kind of sends signals and recognizes the distance between the tip of this probe and the surface of the specimen. And then it creates an image. So here's a picture of DNA that was made with a scanning tunneling microscope. And then the last one is called an atomic force microscope. Uh, kind of similar to the other one, you have this little probe. It runs along, a laser is monitoring the movement of the probe. It's picked by a sensor and then you can kind of almost like braille, you can kind of feel almost by touching. It's making a picture by touching the specimen. And this one's cool because you can actually do it with live specimens. It looks kind of more like a tabletop desktop, not one of those big pieces of machinery like the electron microscopes. Okay, so that was a quick little, um, kind of quick little message talking about um, measurement and microscopy and all the different kinds of microscopes we have to identify these wonderful little microbes. All right, see you next time.